going live. We are now live. Okay. Well, hello there. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today we are going to be talking about um, pacts with the Fae to uh, preemptively sort of round out Fabiary. Ooh. Sorry. 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 Right. Um, so we have almost finished Fabiary, um, a month of Fae themed content here on the Arcane Forge. Um, there is this stream and one more video, I believe it is, about Kitsune's uh, Fox People that's coming out on Monday. Um, but yeah, I just want to talk about um, deals with the Fae, packs with the Fae, what they're like, should you make them, what ones you've used in your campaigns in the past, how your players have sort of interacted with them to sort of help people who are thinking about using the Fae in their games, how they might use them themselves. So I want to hear about your stories, and during this time I'm going to be drawing a uh, Pact of the Fae Warlock um, that is very near and dear to my heart. It is the first D&D character that my wife, Yvonne, uh, ever created, a tiefling called Mara. Um, so I'm going to be drawing her and uh, we can talk about the Fae. Now, my wife, Yvonne, is sitting opposite me and she's going to read out your questions, your comments, your ideas, uh, your thoughts on the Fae, basically, and pacts, whether or not you should get involved in them, uh, what have you. Um, and I really want to hear your ideas in that regard. There's a tiny bit of a delay between what you type um, what Yvonne gets to see and uh, what uh, I hear. That's going to be, you know, roughly like 30 seconds to a minute, something along those lines. Um, and she'll do her best to read out uh, those that seem relevant and stuff like that. But I thought we could just have a chill out and a chat, um, especially given what's going on today. I feel like it's important to acknowledge the fact and not ignore um, the atrocities that are going on in Ukraine right now. Um, this can be our nice escape from um, one absolute psychopathic uh, lunatic's uh, rampant tirade across the world uh, harming so many innocent lives. Uh, if you are being touched by uh, this conflict, um, I would definitely not expect you to be here, but if you are, thank you so much for joining us and know that our sympathies are with you um, and uh, we would love to offer any uh, condolences and assistance um, that we can as a small channel um, but just know that our, our thoughts are with you um, and if you are Russian I know I know obviously you are um, not at the helm of this horrific conflict um, and we we do know and acknowledge that um, the people of Russia do not support uh, largely do not support um, this one uh, absolute madman's uh, decision to go for conquest. Um, so uh, yes, don't worry. This is this is safe for you as well. Um, but obviously, uh, our, our, our hearts go out to the people in Ukraine. Um, I also wanted to thank my patrons over on Patreon who um, are helping to make this content a thing um, and giving us this platform. Uh, so I wanted to thank them for their support this month. There are an awful lot of you um, who are. Um, let me go to my little Patreon list. So I'd like to read you all out. Uh, you've done so much. Um, so this month you are Megan Myrick, Bootsy, uh, Dean Root, Janessa, Inquisitor Thomas, Bronwyn Haller, uh, Kaidasaurus is new. Welcome, Kaida. Uh, is it Kaida or Kaida? Let me know. Um, Matt Moore, Yuda Jorge, Denny Scalf, Doombot9, Rory Gladstone, Rose Selavy, um, Joel Hallett is also new. Nice to meet you, Joel. Um, Jonathan Smith, uh, Ryan Von Agir, Micah, Miles Aldrin, Christian Palmer Smith, AJ, Dominique Jolly, Sam Hickson, Dan Waterman, Tamling, Steve Harrison, Max Copeland, Styrax, Colby Monroe, Darth Gaetana, Max Schluter, Peter Balf, Halfy Wolf, Matt Lichtenwalner, Cav Manic, Braxton Hudson, Bartle, Bartle Gruff the Great, Daniel Williams, Nathan Stratton, Ethan Dibby, Amanda and Jake Westfall, The Smiling Sadist, Nap in Camo, Yorick Beast, uh, George Punton Spencer, um, Wiven Nem. Nemesek, Nemesek, 
with him, either way. Uh, Nicholas G. Silver, Jonathan Foster, uh, and Duck Quack. So thank you all so much for your support this month. It means an absolute ton to me. Um, and uh, yeah, let's let's let this wholesome community, because you guys are absolutely wonderfully lovely, um, be a brief respite from the horrors of the news. And let's talk about our own little fairy tale world um, of the Feywilds and how it's affected you and what kind of pacts and deals you've used in your games. For example, one of my very, very favorites that I always like to use is the very typical, I feel like a lot of people do this as well, is the, um, you know, you arrive at the Feywilds, you arrive at some sort of party or something like that, um, and the convention is that someone will say, can I take your name? Can I take your name? No? Can I take your name? And can I take your name um, in order to, you know, announce you to the party? And what they're actually referring to is literally taking your name permanently. You'll never be able to use your name again because it belongs to that fey creature. Um, so yeah, I want to hear about how you personally have used the fey in your campaigns in that capacity. What deals you've used, whether you'd recommend them, and how you have, almost in a wish spell like manner, managed to sort of twist and turn uh, these mm -hmm. ideas. Um, well, Cavman's came in straight away with one, mm -hmm. um, and they say I had a friend that. Uh, on a World of Darkness game, accidentally traded his concept of fire Ooh. for a pair of cool pants. <laughs> when was un he was unable to start fires or warm up after that. Oh my god! How did that work? How how exactly did the concept of fire leave them? Did they word something in a specific way, or was this a very explicit? Uh, I will take your concept of fire if you X Y or Z. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You know, I'd be intrigued to know. Yeah. Have I ever used the Fae in a very convoluted way to you? Like, was there anything that ever made you... Uh... Well, we did have this session where it was the Masquerade Ball. Oh, yeah. And that ended up... Uh, was that Mara? That backfired on I think that was Mara. Done... Yeah, so... I made a masquerade ball um, in the Feywilds where whatever mask you were wearing when you arrived, you transformed into when you, sort of like when the party started. So we had, I know one person went with like a macaroni mask and I kind of turned them into like a, an ochre jelly for that, like or yeah. like some sort of gelatinous cube or something because um, they were just blech on a mask. Um, and... Uh, you went as like your archfey patron. It was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that kind of uh, makes I, things difficult. Yeah. Is that right? You allowed us to swap masks. Oh yeah, that's what it was. And it was like a mask collection type deal. So yes. I swapped masks with the, the guy who's running yeah, the ball. Yeah, that's what it was. And I had to first, and it yeah. just ruined the game for you. <laughs> I hadn't thought that far ahead. This is my first campaign. I don't think I even realised the power of that until the other players went, oh, oh no. Oh yeah, I think you I think you started off as one thing that could shape change and then it was like you Oh, you, was that it? I think that might have been it. Um and um yeah, you were kind of Because I think you had big plans for the character of Mara and her patron. Yes, and I, I did. And I was like, I'm going to kill this character off. <laughs> like, please don't. I wrote so much about this. Yeah, that is like a trope of yours. It's like, I'm going to change this character a lot, but also I'm done with them after like four sessions. Yeah. So. Um, Cavman says the character had the ability to control flame like a firebender. Mm -hmm. He thought he could get one up on a goblin market on the goblin market by making a fireball you could hold in your hand and traded it directly ah, uh, to a fae. I see. So I was way, way too excited about getting what he thought was just a dumb fireball that wouldn't even mm. last that long. Uh -huh. uh. Oh man, that sucks. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> I'm just so aware in the game that you're always looking for a way, like not to like TPK or like, you know, really punish the players, but mm -hmm. you love this sort of wordplay and twisting. I do, yeah. So when you when your characters like speak in a certain way, I'm like, oh no, oh no, <laughs> I need to think about every single word in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I have a real thing for like um, 
The Fey in particular are so good for, I'm going to follow the word of the law, but not the intention, mm-hmm. um, which is like, you, you really do have to be some kind of lawyer for uh, using the Fey, I think. And it kind of like, there's a lot of um, riffing back and forth about like the use of a wish spell, for example. And there's a lot of people saying like, just let people use wish. You know, but it's like a DM tradition that you have this unlimited power spell mm-hmm. that it's it's a bit of the fun of it as well to like have it go wrong. Like malicious compliance, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I think it's something that malicious compliance is kind of like the fade to a T. Yeah, that sums it up really well. <laughs> yeah. Um, just have to be very specific about what they're complying with, you know? Is there something in the lore of that about why why they don't just like straight up just lie to your face? Why do they phrase it in such a way it's like there's a clue in the way that they're mm. saying it? You're trying to assume otherwise. I think it goes back to fairy tales, um, if I'm honest, because there, whether or not it was this way before, um, like Grimm's fairy tales being directed at children, despite the um, kind of horrific nature of the punishments and stuff involved i think it was always like they're always a cautionary tale there's always something to be learned um and i think it's it's that idea that like a child could outsmart this if they really think very literally but um yeah yeah that kind of thing i think that's the 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 hope anyway that it's like you have to come at this from the angle that a child might yeah uh, that's like i'm going to take this a hundred percent literally i suppose there's usually a lesson kind of in the fairy tales like yeah and if the if the uh, creature or the fairy or whatever just outright lies yeah there's nothing to be learned know. there's nothing to be gained yeah. so it's a story that you have to be able to like triumph over ultimately there has to be an opportunity for the hero to uh succeed and i suppose that's kind of the same way with like devils as well being lawful creatures um and having to follow rules even though they openly want to do you harm whereas i suppose the fey are just like they want to have fun at your expense whether that involves harming you or not you know Mm. so uh we've been doing some planning today for the Mm. next couple of months worth of videos yeah given that we're um drawing my first character today Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't run this past you. No, no, that's okay. But we were going to uh, work on a video about um, mistakes that you can easily fall into with your first character. Mm. So if anyone has any thoughts on that... Um, I'd love to hear that, yeah. actually, yeah. Uh, also, we just asking, is this a drawing of a fey dealmaker or someone making a deal? So this is a drawing of my wa- wife's first D&D character, who was called Mara, and she was a tiefling warlock pack to the fey um so i'm just drawing this particular character who uh, happened to be the lucky recipient of a pact with the fey as an example of kind of i mean it went relatively right right for mara i think mara mara was being deceived pretty much the entire time yeah um but she did she was like a bit of a pariah she uh, grew up and and lived on um in a kind of wild west style desert like area for a huge amount of her life mm-hmm. um and relied and kind of like fell back on this warlock's uh, this um arch phase magic as a means of sprouting new life and new growth and surviving in a fairly inhospitable area mm-hmm. um so yeah I, I think that was that was a part of it for her What do you think her motivations might have been for uh, kind of taking on this pact? Because I don't think we, at that point, I really had much of a, like, solid deal in mind. I know that your patron wanted you to go and perform some tasks mm. um, that, you know, he had, he was trying to tell you that, like, oh, the... Because it was kind of based in an industrial revolution, steampunky kind of setting. And I think the idea was that your patron was trying to tell you the Feywilds, which are intimately connected to our world, are dying off because there's this industrial revolution going on and the connection to nature on the material plane is fading away. So I need you to collect these artifacts that might be able to help us perform some kind of ritual to re-establish new life and new growth 
in yeah. the world and like save the Feywilds. Yeah, also I'm very evil and green and Yeah, exactly. Awesome. It's, it's, it's very hard to, especially if you are like a fresh adventurer and not entirely familiar with the Fey, to have a, a grasp on how much they might want to deceive you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, just to go back to the uh, why do they not tell lies, mm. direct lies, Catherine says, I believe um, that I recall a talk long ago, uh, someone gave on fairies that mentioned that the words fairies and angels were used interchangeably mm. in early discussions of Eastern stories and supernatural natural entities, yeah. so that kind of would make sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, Reed's asking, did the fae patron have a certain theme, a part of the world that they controlled? Um, so they were part of I, I at that point and still kind of do uh, have my um, Fae the Fae worlds are split up in my world e- equally into each of the seasons so each of the Arch Fae have dominion over a particular season um, because when I was first reading about the Fae all I saw was Summer Court and I was like cool great all these autumn is my favourite season let's have the autumn court of the Fae um, so they were, that was supposed to be a kind of a bit of a giveaway that they were like okay with things diminishing and rotting and mm-hmm. maybe, you know, it was beautiful, but at the same time it was like, yeah, maybe, maybe this guy doesn't really care about new growth. If they did, maybe they would be like summer court or spring court or something. Um, but, um, didn't pick up in those subtle ways. <laughs> it's all right. I think that they're, I deliberately made them incredibly subtle because I was like, you know, let's not. Let's not have this be something that we um, openly talk about, you know. Let's not make uh, let's not make this super obvious because otherwise you're going to see straight through everything I want to do. So, given that I killed off the character before uh-huh. we got to that stage, yeah. What was the actual plan with the patron? So the patron, the plan was that you were going to have to do increasingly uh, not cool things to acquire certain incredibly magical objects Mm -hmm. um, that were basically like you were going to be sort of acquiring the equivalent of the Infinity Stones from the Marvel Ah. Universe, but you were told never to touch them um, because they were for Fae only. Um, And basically, um, one of them was like, powering an entire civilization so you're gonna to have to go to like the underdark for example and within the underdark was going to be one of these stones that was like powering the entire capital city of the drow and um you were going to have to take that for yourself and that knowing that that would pretty much guarantee that the un- whole underdark would like collapse because there was nothing supporting it yeah. anymore so like you're going to have to do like all these really like that was going to be like the most obviously like needs of the few outweighing the needs of the many kind of thing um but uh that was kind of it and your um uh fey master was going to take this power for themselves and use it to uh overgrow the fey wilds into all other planes essentially so the fey the fey wilds were going to become this uh dominating force across um, all of the the Feywild, yeah. uh, all of the the planes of reality, basically. Oh, sorry, I read that story. Like, that's <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um, um, Reed says, "I like that. I have thought about Fey courts that control the cardinal directions mm. and have presence in every plane. Mm. The east is an advantage currently, as the sun rises in the east. Ah, oh, that's cool. Um, and they can shoot solar fire like lasers." That's very cool. Um, Catherine says, braiding and intertwining face stuff and naturalist ideas, ideas seem to always be involved. That idea about the fey worlds wasting away reminds me a bit of the disturbance cycle found in nature. Mm. Yes, definitely. Uh, York says, what is your favourite fan cast for a superhero movie? My oldest one was Alan Rickman as a doc- Doctor Octopus. If you were still with us. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I haven't really thought about a superhero movie in a really long time. We're, we're planning on going to see The Batman um, when that comes out because I'm pretty excited about that. But, you know, I would never have cast um, 
uh, what's his name, Robert the guy, Pattinson. Robert Robert Pattinson as uh, Bruce Wayne, but he's probably going to do a really good job, which goes to show I know very little about casting, to be honest. <laughs> um, like, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'd love to see. I mean, you know, obviously I have my my huge crush on Gwendolyn Christie. I would love to see Gwendolyn Christie as like a kind of superwoman power girl super girl type character like we've seen the superman story so many times why don't we have a, a kind of female character embody that role and Gwendolyn Christie is awesome and you looks just cast her in everything. I would cast her in everything yeah but also she does look like she's from another planet and could smash people up so yeah you I know. was attached to the name girl at the end of the yeah I know I, I didn't I didn't really um, invent any of those characters unfortunately girl, yes yeah yeah um Ollie's here which is oh hello hi Ollie Leo's here as well yeah hi Leo's here Lovely um, to see you guys. Cav says, uh, perhaps the storyline about the decay and fairy world needing such a similar equivalent event, let's say decay into stagnant nothingness. I think that's connected to the oh, previous right. yeah. comment. Yeah. Did Mara have a weapon or a tool that she used, by the way? Like, did she have she a staff some, or something? Like one of those daggers that had the sort of twisty. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah. At peak edge lord with this guy. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. You were playing a, like, a devil person, basically. Yeah, a repressed nerd, which had <laughs> not been allowed out until we started playing D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. I went with <laughs> all the cliches. Now. She's an orphan. She's a hermit. She doesn't talk. She's like. <laughs> Yeah. Silent moody type. <laughs> <laughs> She's not nice to people in the group. Wait, why don't the group want to take her with them? <laughs> uh, yeah. Here as well. Oh, hi, Kit. Nice to see you. Uh, Reed says maybe an archery of spring that wants to rule an age of unchecked growth to mm. become a tumorous mass of cancer. Ooh. And an abominable. Oh, here we've got abominable fleshy mind <laughs> unconstrained by the other seasons. I said that okay there. You did very she well, I think. It's from yeah. my friend, who's a primary teacher. Mm. She taught me how to break it down and say it <laughs> like two years ago. I was like, Bless. I just can't say it. Bless you. That's so yeah, cute. Leo's here. Leo. Hi, Leo. Mm -hmm. So, what are you thinking for the pose here? Is this a, a spell casting? Yeah, I sort of saw like a little bit of magic going on here. Um, and we've got your little dagger down here. I wasn't really sure about the pose because I can't remember. She wasn't exactly cocky, but like she was very powerful. Um, and I, I thought like maybe having you a little uh, familiar because you had like a little flaming flying red panda um, Ooh, over here. Called Taco. Uh, yes, called Taco because uh, you're a big fan of the Adventure Zone having that kind of over here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm using the negative space on this side and having some magic on this side and then sort of like having it a very top heavy image because uh, mm -hmm. I've yet to do the horns. I can't quite remember what her haircut looked like. I think it was like a kind of across the eyebrow, like dark hair type thing, but I can't totally remember mm -hmm. um, what she looked like in that regard. Yeah, oh, just go for it. Yeah. Let's see you. I know she had a lot of dangle. She had a lot of dangle and she had loads of necklaces. I remember that much. Did she have feet or hooves? I can't remember how we did her. She had feet. Okay. I don't remember her particularly having hooves. I, I'm always 50 50 on my tieflings. I'm quite happy if people say feet or hooves. Because, um, like, I, I feel satyrs and tieflings have a very similar place. Uh, I think she was a lot skinnier than I'm drawing her, actually. But um, we'll. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Uh... yeah, I think at the time the most my imagination could stretch to was like a human with horns. Yes. I wasn't into anything beyond that. <laughs> anything you suggested, any variation, I was like, nope, no. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, like she's in the modern world, basically, in my imagination. Mm -hmm. Nah. <laughs> Um, it was one of those really interesting things that like um, every person around our table had a really different image of what the campaign looked like and that was quite nice actually I wish I wish everyone at the table had like the artistic ability to render what they um, were picturing because we had like a few artists but there were some people who were describing really cool stuff a 
weirdly skinny and thick in different places now. Um, yeah, they're... Yeah. They're, <laughs> <laughs> the proportions on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really thinking. Uh, let's go for skinny. Because she was a nerd. I remember she was a nerd and she was like kind of skinny and like... She's pretty useless, I think. Yeah. One character that was too efficient to start I've done her looking quite capable as well as weirdly proportioned at the same time. Um, I think we're going to have to... Uh, I'll make her a bit more realistic looking and thin out her legs and arms and stuff. My internet is cutting out, so I don't know whether yours is okay. Have a look. I think we're still on. Uh... I've got I've got like a little loading icon, so I don't know if this is still visible. Uh, error: YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, viewers will experience buffering. Uh, um, so I'm hoping that you're not experiencing buffering right now. But let me know if you are. Um, Reed's asking: Was the steampunk setting similar to the Eberron? It was so similar to Eberron. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was... I hadn't learned what Eberron was at this point, but um, in hindsight... I mean, I'm, I'm glad I didn't know what Eberron was because I ended up making my own world out of it. But if I had known what Eberron was, it largely covered most of what I was going for. So I don't think I would have been as creative in coming up with my own world if I had heard of Eberron but so many of the ideas were so similar um, but yeah it, as a as a view to like if you wanted to picture this world in your head imagining Eberron is so close to, to what it is you you know you, you could do a lot worse uh, than picturing Eberron in your head when it comes to the steampunk setting I feel like D&D in general has kind of moved on to being a bit more steampunky and I feel like uh, things like firearms and stuff I'll you know I could very happily see that being a part of future editions as standard moving away from the kind of crossbow and um, stuff but that's maybe just because I like to set things in that kind of a world I like some level of magical technology to be fairly prevalent um, Cass says, I have a villain that I want to use in a game who treads the line between Fae and Cthulian, mm. the Thorn Baron, which is Ooh, the name, very who cool. seeks to swallow the world and strangling Thorn Vines so as to sacrifice it to gain divinity. That's Excellent. a really cool Love that idea. Set up. Um, before I carry on, do you remember what her horns looked like? Were they fairly long? Or? They were like like goat Berlin horns kind of thing yeah back. kind of back the way right okay yeah so they kind of curve forward and back yeah. okay I will I'll get some reference images because I saved like an absolute ton of horn designs from different animals um that I really liked the idea of <laughs> um that kind of thing yeah yeah that's cool that's yeah uh, um, Cav says wands are really just laser guns. Yes, yeah. I don't think I've had a character with a wand or anything in any of our games. Yeah, I, I often like just have that be, um, you know, it kind of depends what your spellcasting focus is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone's used it for player. Yeah. I love it when people do that kind of stuff. Maybe I should make a video about that, like how to make your spellcasting focus actually a part of your character. Because think about, like, as much as with uh, J.K. Rowling and her transphobia, um, but the wands in Harry Potter were so a part of mm. the characters, you know, it would be great to incorporate something of that ilk in um, in a game, you know, make, make that a part of you, you know? Oh, Cap says, the Thorn Baron is loosely based and I was inspired by my endless struggle with invasive blackberry bushes here for working on an invasive weeds crew. Ooh. Okay, well, whereabouts are you? The um, blackberry bushes are invasive. Mm. Hmm. Sounds like the south of England or something like that. I feel like black blackberries have got to be really... Invasive, though. Yeah, invasive. Yeah, maybe not. Um, let's get juice. 
Uh, right. Yeah. Let's have a think about this hair because I, I think you had like, I know it was kind of short. It, I think it had like a badly cut short fringe. Yeah, because I remember oh. she cut it herself, and yeah. she was not very, you know, she wasn't a hairdresser or anything like that. So mm-hmm. made a point of it being like. Uh, scruffy and kind of all over the place. Yeah, she did look like she'd been living in a cave for years. Yeah. Um, Reed's asking, did her fairy patron look anything like anything in particular that might influence the piece's look and colour scheme? That's an interesting idea. Uh-huh. Um, so I took very strong influence from, again, I was obsessed with Hellboy and the Golden Army and he looked very much like Prince Noala in my head. Um, with the kind of because you actually had like the kind of cut across your nose was the mm-hmm. like you had like a his mark was this line across your eyes and nose um, and um, otherwise I don't really think there was much of a uh, you know he looked very elven um, mm-hmm. but I know for a fact you're obsessed with the colour red so I think he would have to have a lot of red and she had like purple skin yeah. So I think that was like a part of it for sure. Like we should definitely include that in our ideas of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and your magic was sort of autumnal themed, wasn't it? it because it was like autumn fae. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. And in terms of clothes, you had some very simple ideas about what you wanted her to look like. I think... She wasn't the one with the big scarf, was she? She was like t-shirt and really like long robe type thing, like long uh, cardigan. cardigan type deal. Yeah, um, yeah no, that was Doris that had the. Oh, of scarf. course, Doris. Yes, you always have amazing names for your characters, um, and I think everything was kind of torn up because again, you were a, like a vagrant, really. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a lot of. Ah, Kath's saying that the patches grow so tall, like 20 feet into the air, uh-huh. um, over acres and acres, turning bone white when it dies back for the winter, um, impenetrable thickets that people sometimes uh, find lost or even stolen and unknown crashed cars in. Jeez. That sounds... That's kind of amazing. Yeah, it looks quite eerie. Yeah. Like, bone white as well is, is a hell of a image Mm -hmm. for that Uh, having this flare out a bit and then puff out over the hand Uh, get some asymmetry in there because that's a sign of a good adventurer somebody's been through some stuff Ah, uh, I think because like you everyone's going to dress largely in a way that's like you start off your adventure with a fairly symmetrical outfit Mm-hmm. Um, and this is one of the things that actually uh, it was Vilt who told me this if you're a big fan of Arcane the uh, TV show which I know you've not watched yet but I would highly recommend to anyone watching if they've not already the um, the people who live in the Undercity and the people who live above ground again this is very similar to my to my Hembury campaign world um, but the people who live in the above city are all perfectly symmetrical if you look at them all of their designs are 100% symmetrical but all of the characters who live underground to show that they're not as wealthy, they're not as well put together, they're not as polished, uh, they all have uh, unsymmetrical features. So um, that's why one of the inventors who, you know, everyone can tell from a mile away, he's from the Undercity, but it's not quite so easy to tell completely why. But to the other characters in this world, they would kind of know this lack of symmetry, all of his facial scarring and, and tarnishing and stuff like that are all um, asymmetrical features, which is, I, I thought was a very interesting. Um, I'm actually going to look up some kind of like Victorian... Because there was like... I know she had cowboy boots, actually, was like a big thing, because she did come from this kind of Wild West continent, uh, which was called Doria in my campaign world. And we love a cowboy boot in this household. Um, so she had cowboy boots for sure. I'll do some quite nice stylized cowboy boots down here and if you've ever worn cowboy boots I would highly recommend them they are my favorite type of shoes uh, they're incredibly durable and like easily the most comfortable shoes I've ever ever worn um, let's 
see what we've got here in terms of like Victorian influences that I can use for her. A kind of Victorian pauper, uh, as it were. Seems like a good call to go for her. Um, it's all looking a bit too dressy for me on my Google search here. Mm, that kind of thing kind of works. Let's do that. Let's do a bit of a. I feel like she would have had a lot of. Uh, maybe like the trousers were kind of. Oh no, actually, you know what? You're a big fan of Riot Girl music. Let's have these torn jeans, torn at the knee. Have to be torn at the knee, kind of almost skinny jeans, uh, with a few too many belts maybe to go with the many necklaces. Um, okay, so I don't know what you were saying when I was out there, but mm -hmm. Piltover is the above city, Zorn is the under city. That's your guy, yes, that's from Arcane, the TV show. All right. No, I was bringing uh, up. Oh, you're saying that they can't stay very long. They've got some stuff to see to. No worries. Well, thank you very much for being here for any length of time at all. I appreciate it thoroughly. Um, and Reed says, how did Mara meet her fae patron? Was there a portal hidden or obvious or dream vision? Ah. I seem to remember, did she not... She was about to die. Uh, she was about to die and she went into a cave and there was like water in the cave. Uh. And uh, yeah, so she found him through that, I believe. Um, but uh, that's just from my recollections. If you have a stronger memory of it, then um, yeah, please. Oh, you had like a little cat necklace. I remember that because you could like summon. Uh... Oh, she, just, she collected bizarre necklaces. Yeah. They all, she seemed to just end up picking up. Yeah. Um, magical necklaces and anything that wasn't a necklace she just decided to just like, yeah. tie it around her neck <laughs> to make it necklace. yeah exactly <laughs> I remember that uh, Cyrix says that they would recommend Arcane too but they didn't pick up in the cemetery yeah it was a really interesting feature um, yeah you're quite into your sort of film theory and stuff but you quite often yeah. can like predict to like what's going to happen in a film just because of the way a shot's lined up you're like oh well that's obviously going to be the bad person like you can't tell that from a <laughs> shot and the next scene it's like they're the bad person like, oh. not every time but there are certain tropes that we like to use um yeah like if you see a dutch angle ever it's just like well this is either a bad guy or someone's having a panic attack you know <laughs> like, <laughs> and if they're eating an apple if yeah oh yeah anyone eating an apple is a um what's a polite way of saying that um uh, is a yeah. cocky person um who is likely not going to be everyone's friend a draco malfoy um kind of character <laughs> yeah. um in, however you would say that in uh in pg language yeah how do you say that what yeah um what would you <laughs> How to insult someone politely? Uh, a jerk. A jerk. That's what we're looking or for. A jackass, I guess that's. Yeah. That's not as that's not as rude. Yeah, it's not as rude because yeah. you're referring to a donkey. But I think, uh, yeah. That, um, that so the cowboy book chat, which I missed, yes. um, has reminded Cav of a catch earlier playing a changeling in a different world of darkness game. Ooh. Is that was set within the D&D universe, World of Darkness? I have absolutely no idea. I don't think so. I think World of Darkness is um, uh, like Vampire Masquerade and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, um, but I can't be 100% certain. Set on a kind of gothic trigon? Like world, Trigun? Uh, so Trigun is a uh, an anime that is kind of uh, like Wild West, I think, in space. Uh, yeah. The right. vampires did something that split the timeline, which pulled my character back into a new alternative world oh. after being stuck in the hedge forever, uh, which was repressed as a massive blistering desert due to the lack of natural fae in the world. Oh, damn. Oh, Represented, like sorry, as a massive blistering desert that's very cool I like this yeah 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 great idea um Reed's asking a bit familiar so yeah 
she did tell us it was like a floating red panda. Yes. But we, you were just letting me have a lot of license because I was so sort of stubborn about it. Well, um, kind like of. Particular thing. So, like. <sighs> I think that. I yeah, so a DM girl girlfriend pass a little bit on that character. He just really wanted me to get into it. I did, but at the same time, like I, I think um, I got unlimited time for uh, the phrase counts as. So, like, mm. if you know, it your familiar was an imp. Uh, you know, is the demonic imp that we we changed it to being a fey creature because that fit your backstory more, um, and we just made it look like a um, a burning red panda like a, a red panda made out of fire because you like flamey stuff and you like red pandas and it had all the stats of an imp so it was like mm-hmm. I anyone who wants to do anything like that if, if someone says I want to be able to cast fireball but I want my magic to be blue it's less like yeah who's who's casting red fireballs anymore like just do whatever you want Like the mechanics of it work but if you want it to be you know, you want it to be flavoured in a way that suits your character, please do that. You know, you don't need to mm. come up with a bunch of new stats. Um, yes, well, that was his, uh, World West in Space describes so many enemies. Yes. <laughs> uh, Cowboy Bebop, in particular, was was really good. Oh, um, yeah, World of Darkness is a vampire masquerade. Ah. The, the masquerade, but we would make custom worlds. Ah, uh, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. Um, my character was like Doc Holliday from the Tombstone movie. Weird, pale, sickly, but a night changeling. So oh, nice. they do stuff like compress himself like a worm and crawl down drain pipes. <laughs> I probably did a TKP with that. Oh, well, that definitely sounds like one of your characters for sure. Uh, Reed says, I can picture some creepy, uh, little creepy sprite pretending to be a red panda with some weird little fey touches. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have a little. Oh. I'll have a little draw of Taka in a second. Uh, let's do yeah, little memes, which I'll cover in a second. Oh, lotus pod eyes and rose thorns for teeth. Ugh, <laughs> that is so gross. Who uh, said that? Because banned. <laughs> no, read. No. How dare you? Um, no, I just had. So it, it wasn't like an in pretending to be anything. It was just, you know, there's just this type of creature now exists because that's fun. But yes, I do also thoroughly love the idea of uh, having like a creature impersonating something else. I did have a familiar, I had a boggle familiar join my party at one point, um, who was a, just a very, very oily cat, uh, called boggle. Um, and, uh, it just said the word meow instead of meowing and constantly oozed a black slime. And it was just like, the, the, the uh, player just played it off really well by going like, yeah, that's just a cat. Um, and everyone else in the party was like, there's something so wrong with your cat. Why is your cat leaking? Um, it's just like, got a leaky cat. That's, you know, don't look a gift cat in the mouth, you know, <laughs> which was fun. Yeah. Uh, Boggle and the Nilbog are two of my favourites. Yes. Favorite We've had some good times with both of them, I have to say. You like annoying things, by the sounds of it, in that case. Yeah. Um, which is good to know, so I can step up the annoying. It's got to be the right amount of annoying, though. Yeah, you didn't like the um, uh, frustrating, um, what was it, the fairy dragon, dragon fairy, whatever it's called, fairy dragon, that I introduced in the museum encounter. They were too annoying. <laughs> Yeah, I was, yeah, we, did, had you not designed that you were like, oh yeah, I gotta love this character? I did, yes, I'd fully... Bono wants to take this character with them, so that's like really helpful for the plot. Yeah. And then it was so irritating, I was yeah. just like, nah, nah. No, too I'll annoying. leave it, I walk away, and you were like, no, baby. Please, I spent so long hoping you'd take this with you. Um, in the end, it asked you a series of riddles and then gave one of the other party members a whistle that could turn 
people into objects using like a kind of polymorph spell. Um, so it ended up being useful. It just, uh, just not to you. <laughs> yes, Lavelle says, no big deal, but I would totally die for Boggle the Leaky Cat. <laughs> and Reed's asking, are Bogglers related to the Fae in your session? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, they, you know, stem from uh, Germanic folk tales and legends of that nature. So they seem like they fit nicely within that world. I don't necessarily have like a um a fixed law for my goblins yet um i have some sort of loose ideas about how i want them to operate um and i kind of have like all goblinoids being in some way tied to the fey and perhaps that you know elves and goblins and trolls and things like that all have kind of a common ancestor um that they will stem from but obviously the elves would prefer you don't really think about that too much uh, to be associated with goblins in that capacity but that's one of the reasons why I like hobgoblin so much as like a civilization of people uh, that they could have their own culture and so on that could be inspired by the harsh life of being in the uh, in the underdark How about you? How do you use them? So we're, we're friends with a, a local hairdresser and I feel like he would have some words to say to me about the haircut I'm giving this character. <laughs> I feel it's like a it is a lockdown hairdo for sure. Oh, he's back. He was away reading. What was it? The Hobbit? Oh, that's very cute. Nice one. How far through are you? Oh, um, I have a few minutes before the D&D players arrive. Ooh. Oh, lucky you. Goodness me. Uh, Reed's asking, have you ever read the similar... Sim Cimmerillion. Cimmerillion. Um, I read some in elementary school, but I haven't retained much. Just stuff about the sil similar. <laughs> Cimmerils? Cimmerils and the Angoliant? Uh, Angoliant, yes. Angoliant. Uh, sorry, don't worry. These are intentionally very difficult um, words uh, that, well, that's, you know, if you're uh, incredibly familiar with Tolkienese then uh, perhaps not, but it does take, you know, he did create his own languages and stuff. So um, yes, I, I've not actually read it. Um, it takes me a really long time to read stuff um, and reading uh, a lot of that seems like something I would not manage particularly well. But I do know a few of the stories, like I know some of the like cooler legends uh, that are super interesting, like an elven king taking on like nine balrogs and you know the fun stuff basically i've had the tldr of the cimmerillion um told to me in the past but i don't know much about it personally i've heard that the tv series that's coming out could have been the cimmerillion to some extent um and uh that that's pretty good news really um, so, yeah, uh, if you have read it, or uh, I would love to hear how, how what you think about it and whether you think it's good, basically, and whether you think this TV series that's going to come out is likely to cover that same sort of ground. So the TV series isn't covering what the films have already covered? No, it's, it's covering entirely different stories, and it, from my impression is that it largely follows uh, Galadriel um, as... Because she's, she's been around since, like, the beginning of time, if that makes... You uh -huh. know, pretty much. She's, like, one of the oldest, wisest, most powerful characters in the whole uh, thing. So they've just gone, like, cool, who's the biggest badass in uh, Lord of the Rings? Let's make a story about her. Um, is my impression from the trailers, at least, I've 
decided to stay relatively spoiler free um which i don't know how much that's going to be the case as time goes on but you know i'm you know not arguing with it um and i've seen a lot of shots of her in armor which looks cool and she's doing some like stunts and stuff and i've got time for it so i'm hoping that i will be told the story of the simarils through galadriel's perspective because she seems like the kind of person who would be good for that you know Mm -hmm. if she was there when they were about um no dear i've obviously not so the consensus seems to be that it's heavy boring it's kind of dense yeah uh, he says that uh, their, their elementary school brain skimmed over a lot yeah I think I mean I've heard that I used to work for a company that did art based on Lord of the Rings and then mm. um, yeah, even the ones in the department that were really into the books struggled with the thin lip Simmer Simmer Really, really on. So we're really on. Yeah, there you go. That's all right. Don't worry. Oh, it's a, dear. Oh, it's um, no shame in it. Have it's a nonsense word. I have, uh, I have most most of a campaign idea featuring goblins le- uh, leaning into their fear gremlin like nature a little bit labyrinth like. Oh yeah. Having them be a byproduct of a malignant magical pollution that mutates from smaller wildlife. Very cool. Different type coming from different critters, frogs become goblins, fish become grindelos, yeah. kobolds and canids, oh. um, and a bunch of others combined uh, some races, combined some races back into being goblinoids. Very cool. So, no, that sounds uh, very nice. I like the sound of it. Uh, uh, Ollie says the book's like, um, like a Middle Earth history book, basically. Excellent. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the things that I, I find most interesting about um, Tolkien in general. Is uh, I saw an interview with with Peter Jackson, and I suppose I'd not really thought of it this way, mm. but um, it sounds like um, Tolkien was really upset as an Anglo-Saxon historian that. Um, in various invasions and, um, you know, throughout time, Saxon history, um, the the history and lore and legends and folklore of the people who lived in the British Isles, which he took immense pride in, um, had been intentionally scrubbed from history and lost to people. And as a historian, what he wanted to accomplish with the Lord of the Rings is to make a... A, mytho- a mythology, a history of um, this land, you know, and because we weren't given one. Um, so his, like, leanings into actual mythologies and histories were designed intentionally to give us, like, you know, what would the Thor and Odin and all this kind of stuff of our land be like? Um, and he treated it like it was a real history, which is why there's so much... Uh, like needlessly long descriptions of everything that like people would have taken the time to write about like you know ancient Egyptian mythology isn't all the exciting stuff there's also all the really boring like this guy begat this guy and this guy begot this guy and uh, you know Osiris had 37,000 goats or something along those you know this kind of stuff um, that he chose to include because it seemed more authentic to a Saxon person's mythological cosmogony um, rather than necessarily a um, a story, a fantasy story. He didn't treat it like fantasy. He treated it like it was some ancient uh, person's take on how everything got here, um, which is really cool. Uh, Reed says Tolkien started with the languages, then wrote a history and a set of metaphysics that fit with it. Yeah. Uh, and then sent sent an anti-industrialist message all along the way. Yeah. Um, Bless him for that. Uh, yes, the bell says as if Angles and Saxons themselves didn't invade Britain. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I suppose it, it's the whole crumbling castle approach, really, isn't it? I was always fascinated with that as a student. The idea that like. 
from the perspective of what I was learning, at least it was based in language, but the idea that there was one correct time in history and everything mm. since then has crumbled and gotten worse rather than just we're a bunch of weird apes who try and make sense of stuff that's going on and we've been changing forever you know <laughs> there is no right way was it C.S. Lewis that uh, Tolkien had a big beef with I think it was I, I can't remember if they were really it's definitely Tolkien and one other like quite famous author that who, just who was it who did Narnia Yes, yes, yes. I see. I think they were pals because they. I know that there's a famous thing where they turned up to a totally non-fancy dress party, both dressed as polar bears, <laughs> um, for some reason. But they may have had beef. I don't know. Because it turns out, if you write your own mythological history, you're probably some kind of lunatic. And welcome to that club. Oh, okay, so they disagreed on certain things, but they appear to have been dear friends. Okay, so well, rivals, let's call say. Call each other Jack and Tollers for Tolkien. Oh, it's kind of cute. I think, like, the Narnia series could be a really good influence. Some of the, mm. the books outside the line, which in the wardrobe. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with them. It would be quite cool to explore some of them. Yeah, I always like to set up for the magician's nephew for the different pools. Through. Is that the one you? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's one you always talk to me about. And I'm just like, I need, I need to know more about this. Um, C.S. Lewis was his friend, but was a super religious, uh, born again style guy that used fantasy to push his stuff. Yeah. I see. Right. Okay. So yeah, they may not have seen eye to eye on that kind of stuff. Because mm -hmm. Tolkien sounds like he was almost pantheist, you know, which wasn't uncommon in that time um, during the Industrial Revolution. There's a huge revival of pantheism in no small part due to Wordsworth and Coleridge I think actually um, who were also into that and you know Shelley and you know that kind of uh, the romantics that's what they're called but that might have been a different time I'd be getting my timelines muddled up oh, I never made it to the final book the final book has all the protagonists except for two from all the books die in a train crash and go to heaven what? as the world of Narnia dies. Oh, what a flip. Yeah. I think my mum read me, started to them from the beginning a couple of times, but only got as far as the horse and his boy. Uh -huh. And um, I think my mum just lost the will to it. But <laughs> yeah. It's very Christian coded. Yeah, but uh, that was totally went over my head as a kid. Yeah. Like, as a teenager, I remember someone saying, oh yeah, Aslan's God, aren't they? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a lion, guys. Yeah. 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 I wonder if any like places where religions like a big deal, uh, like really enjoyed Narnia on that level. You know, like if you went to America, if everyone was like, "Oh yeah, totally, we're well into this," but like everywhere else in the world, it was just like, you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, if you want to because um, obviously religion doesn't have that kind of hold in the UK um, but you know America's big into its religion but um, I wonder if like because like, I wonder if, is that like superhero level like is it like a cool thing to like I don't, I don't know um, either way. Um,
What can you tell us about Mara? What do you remember about her, if anything? Mm, it's like what I was saying earlier. Like, you seem to remember more about my characters than I do. I remember a decent bit about her, but like. I remember the first session that we played with uh, the rest of the group. Mm. Like, I decided that you, you wanted them. Um, or the group decided they were going to go and stay in an inn. Oh, God, and I was like, yeah, oh, well, my character sleeps in a cave normally, so she wouldn't want to sleep in a hotel. Uh-huh. So um, she'll sleep in a tree. And uh-huh. you were like, okay, roll. <laughs> uh, roll random encounters. Yeah. For getting and I was like, what? And you were like, well, if you sleep in a tree, bad things can happen. And I was like, oh my God, that's so unfair. That's so petty. Why would you do this to me? You were so annoyed with me. I was me. so super annoyed. I was like, look. <laughs> She just wants to sleep in a tree, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you were like, roll. <laughs> yeah. You're, it was like you're in the middle of a like the capital city. <laughs> sleeping um, in a tree. Sleeping in a tree. Roll. You are probably going to get robbed. Let's just let's find out what's going to happen to your character. Um, yeah, you weren't you weren't pleased with me. So I gave you a flaming red panda. <laughs> Please don't be annoyed. Um, Reese. As in, I'm here, what did I miss? Oh, uh, goodness me, so much, um, but also not much. We're just chilling, um, and we had the vague notion of talking about uh, the Fae and Pacts with the Fae and whether or not they're a good idea and, you know, and how you might have used them in your games. Um, but in the meantime, I'm also drawing my wife's first character, who was a Pact of the Fae uh, Archfey Warlock, uh, who was a tiefling called Mara, and kind of talking about, I mean, we've been talking about Tolkien and drawing tieflings and stuff, basically. So, welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh, Kat's joined us as well. Oh, hi, Kat. Nice hi, to Kat. see you. Hope you're having a lovely day. Um, Ollie says either that's some super low-fi hip-hop or a clock in the background. It's a clock. Yes. But you can uh, put some yeah, lo-fi on. I might be able to put some lo-fi on. I, I think YouTube has different rules to Twitch about uh, what kind of... Um, stuff I can put on, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Because I do tend to put lo-fi on in the background of Twitch, but YouTube is like primed for panic mode, um, and being sued. So. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, let's not get sued. I pr- would definitely prefer that. Not even a little bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, Myrtle. I think she just burped. Um, and I can I can smell it. Oh my god. It's so nasty. Why, little Myrtle? Why are you doing this? I love that dog so much, but she is very smelly. You just snore away, pal. Uh, yeah, there you go. Is she looking roughly how you remember her so far from the sketch and yeah, stuff? Good, yeah, pretty good. Um, okay, there. It's the cowboy boots. I can't remember. I think the cowboy boots were brown, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Ah, feel free to just just wear go. It. Yeah. Go with what you. Okay, I will. Um, Oh, Ollie says I'll make you three hours. I'll have to make you three hours of lo-fi. Oh yeah, please. <laughs> I would, yeah, I'd love that. Um, I just think it's funny that every now and again, there's like one in the background, and you're like, "Wait a minute, is that like some sort of angsty early two thousands?" Oh my god. Song we made is like Plinky Plonky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like some limp biscuit that's done in a kind of like. Uh, Wishy washy lift music style. I love it. Uh, Yukota? Yukota? Uh, please tell me that you watch uh, Legend of Fox Machina. It was so amazing. I've not actually watched it, um, I'm sorry to say. Um, but I will, I definitely will. Is it on Netflix or is it some other place? I've not even done your tale yet. Um, is, is it. Um, elsewhere because I don't actually know where to look for it but I've heard amazing things obviously I think the critter community 
are somewhat biased in their adoration and worship of the Critical Role team, who are amazing, don't get me wrong, but um, I will. I need a review from someone who's not followed like every episode of Critical Role to tell me if it is amazing. I get the impression it is going to be amazing no matter what, though. Um, but yes, I would love to hear someone's take on it. It's on Prime. It's on Prime. Okay, okay. We have Prime. We can we can watch that. Um, um, is it is it just following uh, basically redoing um, season one of Critical Role as an animated series, or is it telling different stories? Either way, very excited. Uh, I think what I want to do is have that just hidden. Oh, uh, Captain Dutton's joined us. Hello, nice to see you. Um, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, 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 all good. Um, is there any chance that you could grab me a glass of water? Just if there's if there's some water nearby or something. Just realised that I set up here and now I am uh, totally. Thank you very much. Totally parched. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but I need to yes. head off. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'll check back in later and see the progress. Yeah, the finished marring. Yeah, yes. we have full creative license. My goodness. You can just do whatever you want with this character. Right, so I just I'll just draw butts everywhere then. In that case. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Have a wonderful time. <laughs> um. Yeah. Oh dear. Um. Can't be trusted. But, um, let's see how this comes out if I were to do the tail over here. Yeah, okay, that works. Um, let's move that out a tiny bit. Yeah. And then I want to have this beneath the jacket, but above the boots. So somewhere here is the rest of the tail. Uh, have that come on over here. Um, so have you guys ever used Fay Patron Warlocks? I want to know, inquiring minds want to know. Um, because I really like them. I don't think they're like the most potent. They're not sort of like a game changer in terms of uh, their power output, but they have a lot of really useful abilities. Um, and I'd be keen to know if uh, they are a staple in your game or if people just can't resist going for like Pack to the Blade or whatever it is, you know, the. Uh, Hexblade, sorry, Hexblade Warlocks. Because um, we love a Hexblade, obviously, Hexblades are wonderful. Um, but there's something about the flavour of a Fey Patron Warlock uh, that is just really hard to resist, isn't it? I am going to duplicate this layer and put that above the jacket, I think. Getting rid of. Uh, most of it. Mm, not that bit though. Undo the razor. Let's stick that on multiply so I can actually see where everything is. Um, right, let's see uh, what we've got here. Um, 
in terms of talking about uh, Legend of Vox Machina, uh, Captain Duckton says, I can say the story's okay, it looks amazing, and the action is top notch, and you've had some good laughs. Excellent, that sounds good. Uh, the first two episodes are uh, based on just before they, they started streaming the campaign. Uh, you just dropped your uh, goblin sketching in the art channel. Excellent, Cabman. For those of you who don't know, there is a Discord group. Um, you're very welcome to join. It should be in the description box uh, where you can join the Discord and say hi and share your lovely art, among other things. Talk about all sorts of topics. We have all sorts of things um, to join over there. And that is welcome. Everyone is welcome to join that no matter what. Um, including seeing Catman's Coplin drawings by the sound of it. Uh, Reed says, you're always tempted, you like the law, this is in terms of the uh, Fate Patron Warlock, uh, you like the law, but it always feels a little constrained by Warlock Patron choices for some reason, yes. Um, I totally get that, absolutely. I'm very surprised that there's not been a dragon-themed um, patron uh, I kind of get that that would largely be made redundant by the kind of demon pate was um, that comes with the base game, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I miss it. I miss the idea of that. I feel like that's a, a very obvious one. Maybe encroach too much on a sorcerer's um, backstory, but then we have wild magic sorcerers and we have wild magic barbarians, so I feel like we should have that extra bit of flavour for warlocks as well, it seems... Uh, bizarre to me that those don't already exist. Um, you haven't played D&D yet, Reese. I really hope you'll get the chance to. Um, have you played any other role-playing games or have you played video games that are similar? Um, and have you tried playing online or is, it, is there just a, it's not, not really something that you can uh, group together and, uh, and enjoy? Mm -hmm. Goodness. Um, right, so what was I doing? Was I going to do a little cravat, I think? Patreon. Uh, Could be cool. Um. noises happen here um it says that youtube is struggling here so there might be some buffering going on let me know if um you are struggling to see stuff um but you know if there's like a break or a buffer or something along those lines just let me know um hopefully we can sort something out i got that little warning come up there for a sec there, do they? Uh, let's get rid of the hair, let's get rid of the jacket. Oh yeah, missed a lot of bits. If you can hear snoring in the background, by the way, that is just Myrtle snoring away. It's very cute. She's been pretty adorable right now but it's also bloody noisy um, uh, so beneath that layer we need a dagger And I should save soon, I think. I think with, I'm, I'm playing with fate right now that I've not saved in a while. Um, 
Uh, Reese says, in terms of playing D and D, you can't really do it um, uh, because of equipment shortage. Fair, and also anxiety uh, also uh, buffered it a bit for me. Fair dues. I totally understand that. Um, don't you worry. Uh, I'm sure that uh, one day you'll get the chance. I would recommend if you are really into the idea of it um, and feel that like text chat might be better uh, suited. There are multiple kinds of uh, Discord groups and things of that nature that have a, a text theme to them so you don't have to be like doing impressions and voice acting and so on. Um, if that makes it feel more comfortable to you but also don't feel in a rush to, to go out and do anything that makes you uncomfortable in that regard. You know, you just... Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're enjoying the content in the capacity that you are. And yeah, there's no pressure to to play the game uh, just now. You just do what makes you comfortable. And life is about maximizing happiness, no matter how you find it, whether it's in this group or if it's uh, just by enjoying things the way you currently do, you know? Excuse you, Myrtle. That's getting really quite loud now. Ah, uh -huh. good grief. Um, let's get a nice belt going on. Duck says, well, good morning, Duck, hello. Uh, just popping in to say good morning while you're getting ready for work. Thank you very much for being here. I'm glad to see you. I don't actually know what time it must be in Australia right now, but, but thank you very much for being here. Uh, buffered for a few seconds. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, just let me know if we drop at any time, um, and I will make sure to uh, cover whatever we've been talking about. Oh, back starting to go. Um... Okay, I might start doing some detail now and then kind of come back to things like the necklaces uh, after that. Uh, you've got to leave for school soon. Uh, no worries, Reed. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope you have a fantastic, fantastic day. And yeah, just be you. Enjoy life however you want to enjoy it. Um, right, let's go over skin here and go for some line work oh myrtle that's some serious noise you're making pal Please tell me that wasn't a little myrtle guff that I just heard. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for that. Uh, I see that. Actually, let's get the hair back here. Uh huh. I'm hearing some peculiar. Sounds here, Myrtle. You okay? What the hell is going on here? Oh, yeah. Uh, we want this here, don't we? Here we go. That's what we're not seeing. Um, okay.
Myrtle Pearl. Are you alright? I'm starting to get legitimately concerned. There's some serious dog music going on on the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I'll do my line work and then you can come up for a little little breather. Don't like that nose at all. Did a terrible job of that. Um, Right, um, a tiefling kind of looks like the lady from Devil May Cry, probably the hairstyle. I've never played Devil May Cry, so I don't know who you're talking about, but uh, she has Devil May Cry vibes for sure. Oh man, I need to... Um, is that the one with the with Dante, with the white hair? Because that, that was definitely... One of the games I really wanted to play as a kid, but I never actually got round to it. I feel like, as well, uh, I would not be very good at that kind of game because I'm not very good at like combos and stuff. Like, I just, I'm, I'm a button masher for sure. Like, Elden Ring has just come out and is universally getting 10 out of 10 and is like kind of like supposed to be accessible for people who love Soulsborne games but have never had like been had much luck with them. Which is me. I love the Soulsborne kind of games, but I'm terrible at them. And I'm so tempted to get it, but at the same time, I know I'd be shockingly bad at that too. I know I'd be shockingly bad at that as well. Um, so do I risk it? I don't know. Maybe I'll stream it if I do get it. Um, but uh, I feel like that would be... Uh, you'd, you'd see me get angry, I think, because uh, I'm not very good at that kind of game, and I don't know if it's a good idea to be particularly. You know, anger can be help healthy. You know, it's it's. Um, you know, you should never shut off any of your emotions. You should, but being angry in a healthy way is often, you know, not easy. Um, uh, yes, one with Dante with white hair. Yes, definitely. Okay, so late you had an appointment. Don't worry, Steve. I'm so glad you're here. It's lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. I hope your appointment was wonderful. I hope it was a good appointment and not a bad appointment. Um, but yeah. want any more details on the tail I probably want a couple oh yeah tail that male we want uh, to you uh, that will do the line work for that um Ugh. Ugh. 
I need a bit of a stretch before I carry on, so I think I will bring little Murty up here, who has been very cosy, but also is doing the soundtrack for the channel tonight, aren't you? A very, very noisy girl. Uh huh. Yeah, snoring away. Hello, everybody. This is Myrtle, if you've not met her before. She's my little snow goblin. Very beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. But you're also very smelly and very, very noisy. Uh -huh. Shamed. Shamed on live YouTube. Yeah. Um, right, it was a good one, not a bad one at all, says Steve. Uh, excellent, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, there we go. Whew, right, let's get some shading on this skin, I think. Hmm. There, new layer. Let's get some shade. Let's throw some shade. <laughs> I amuse myself. Mm -hmm. I want to have a decent bit of shade around the eye line. Going for a kind of grunge aesthetic here. Uh, which I suppose, does that apply to Devil May Cry? I suppose, yeah. Anime grunge, maybe. But definitely grunge. We've got some. Some good grunge aesthetic going on here. I feel like Kurt Cobain would be pleased. Maybe a bit of emo. Something with the self styled hair, you know? Um, huzzah! Yeah, you know, she's doing very well. Uh, sort of interacting with other people, even though the pandemic's not been great for socializing her. Um, so we're very happy with that. But at the same time, um, she is not really enjoying the massive storm we're in the middle of. I don't know if you guys have that um, where you are, but we have had snow and rain and hail over the past couple of days, and it is absolutely horrendous outside. It is super, super nasty. Um, so, yeah, I hope you're getting some relief from that. Um, but yeah, it is pure nasty. get some uh, eye stuff going on here. Let's go for Fae uh, magic being a part of this, this kind of like forested green kind of color. And I think she had some, uh, what would you call it, some like, grunge-like makeup for sure around the eyes. I know she had like a kind of scar line across her nose that could have been makeup, could have been a tattoo. I don't think it was, I don't think it was quite obvious what was going on there. But let's go for the uh, eye shadow for a start and see where we get. Um, there's definitely something in the neighborhood of that running across her eye line. Really blow out this kind of smoky eye look, maybe. Um, across the whole ridge here. I 
think so. Um, and I think I'm going to go for a line across the nose, but I'm not totally sure. So bear with me. Uh, nose gone? Question mark. Um, I know it existed, but whether it was like a dark line or if it was just like, you know, paint, I can't quite remember. Uh, either way, I think I've got a good brush that would meet us halfway for that kind of like a gritty sponge kind of brush. Let's have a let's have a go at this. A bit like Hawk from um, Dragon Age Two, I suppose. What I'm going for here. That looks nice to me. Um, so, uh, Steve asks, "What's this person's deal?" Faye Warlock. Yes, this is uh, my wife Yvonne's first D and D character. Um, she was a tiefling called Mara, who was a Fey patron warlock. And seeing as we were discussing uh, packs with the Fey, whether or not you should make them. Um, and what they sort of have entailed in your campaign so far. I thought I would draw her while we talk about that, but the conversation has kind of derailed. Still, if you have any particular pacts that you have used, any deals and ways that you've been deceptive with the Fae, I would love to hear them. Um, but yes, this is Mara that I am working on here, and uh, this is my wife's first character, a uh, Warlock Pact of the Fae. Um, Oh, Willem asked roughly the same deal, so I, I hope that answers that question. Um, uh, Cabman and Reese are both experiencing the snow, uh, bright and sunny during the day, um, and at least Reese is in the UK as well. Yes, yeah, so it is. It's pretty grim here, um, but um, yeah, glad we're not alone. Uh, I think that will probably do us for the skin. Uh, let's see what we've got in relation to, I think we could do the hair next, top of the hair at least. Um, excellent, yes, there you go. I've got a few nice hair brushes that might work for this. Not actual hair brushes, mind you, but um, a nice kind of thing that might work for us. If I were to get rid of the sketches here. And look what this might eventually look like. Get this kind of like shaggy, matted look to the hair. She's cut it herself, you know? How, how good was it gonna go? Probably not great. I think she's done a good job, all things considered. Change the opacity here so it's a little bit darker. There you go. That's pretty much what I really want to do with her hair. Um, you can hear the winds now. Yes, definitely. Same. Uh, it's battering the windows here. 
Um, uh, Steve says, cool, you like it, especially the broken convention. Most would expect a demonic patron of some kind. So being powered by the Fae is very cool indeed. Yes, I'm a big fan of breaking convention, uh, especially in that sort of regard. Uh, you're going to be toying a little with your players uh, while they're in the Feywild. They're pretty clear about what they think the Feywild is, and I hope to be able to surprise them. I hope so too. I hope uh, that the videos have in any way assisted you in that regard. Um, what have you got pl planned for your players? If you can reveal that, if they're not watching as well, um, what can you kind of share, if you can at all? I would love to hear. Um, Let's get a bit more of this jacket on the go. Oh dear, metal. Definitely save there because I can't remember the last time I did. Um. Um, let's get some nice dark lines going on for the jacket. Might put some texture in this jacket as well, being kind of like muddied up from years of traveling on the road. It's very much a kind of hermit-like character who was to some extent rescued, I guess, by their connection to the Feywild in a time of dire need in a kind of wild west steampunky uh, location in my campaign world so I think having a having this act like a, a crimson duster and thus being covered in you know dust seems like a good call for this character Um, you're gonna go grab a coffee. Don't worry. Thank you for being here. Why are you good? Um, yes, 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 yes. I need to work on a background for this character as well, um, just to have kind of something. Uh, desert like in the back maybe I'll do that on stream maybe I won't kind of depends on uh, how we do for time in terms of completing this um. I'm kind of liking that without texture to be perfectly honest um, let's do the ba -ba 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 bandana bit Go for a lighter pink for this one just to make it really stand out the line work uh, coming a one palette illustrator um, making a you know because I love my limited palettes and I've never really learned much about um, uh, color theory but I heard the idea of a limited palette uh, like making your own limited palette based on kind of what you like artistically and it intrigued me, and I was, but I was concerned about having like it being too limited, having all of my drawings be in the same palette. But it's given me a huge range of lots of different colors that 
are still like this is my red this is my pink you know that kind of stuff stuff that will tie all of my artwork together as an illustrator and i'm really thankful that i've done it um especially these these reds there's a lot of variety in the red spectrum uh, that we ended up coming up with and i just yeah i think it's really neat um Ian Fitzgerald says, um, as a god of shadows and dreams, the DM implied uh, that was something that happened in every generation, something else taking up the mantle. Have I missed something? I think I've missed a previous comment here. Either way, happy to see you, Ian. Um, Thank you for being here. Well, already gambled with an entity called the Man of Masks. Yes, excellent. While he's not malevolent, there's another chap called Aphilion, who's very malevolent. And Aphilion is also a shapeshifter. Gotta love a shapeshifter. Gotta love a shapeshifter. Well, I mean, you don't actually have to. As a DM, you gotta love a shapeshifter. Um, bravo to you. Aphilion's plans. Am I pronouncing that right, or is it Aphilion or Aphilion? Um. You're back, and you've got smoky bacon crisps. Oh my goodness! Ah, uh, yeah, I haven't had smoky bacon in ages. Miss that very much. Um, uh, yeah, let's go for. Uh, I think we can do the belt now. I tell you what. Uh, yeah. Belt line work. Let's test something out on the belt and see if it works. And if it does, we can use it on future layers. I want to use some lighter line work to make some interesting kind of like cowboy leather patterns, that kind of arcanthus leaf design maybe. Um, that seems to be very, very popular on kind of deep south art. Um, uh, Ian Fitzgerald played a thief priest reskinned past the Fey, Pact of the Fey, uh, named Scanthier once. His warlock level ups were him assuming more power uh, of his patron until he took their place fully. My goodness, that's a really cool idea. I love that. Love that for you. I had one of my players kill their patron at one point 
Um, and I am curious what you would do in that situation. Because what I had happen was, it was right at the very end of the campaign, mind you, but I had that be, that's the end of your character's power. They were borrowing power from someone, and once you kill them, um, they are now just a dude. Um, they don't necessarily have powers anymore. Um, but that was maybe maybe a tiny bit cruel. But it seemed like a nice way of rounding off that person's character as well. Dear Myrtle, what's going on? So much noise happening. Lots of golden ratios in that pattern. Yes, absolutely. Um, might have defeated the patron's power flow into the character, making them some kind of sorcerer. Yes, that's a very good call. I think if we'd planned to carry on the campaign, that's more something I would have done uh, for sure. But um, yeah, I wish it. I mean, it, yeah, the campaign worked out really nicely. I'm, I'm super happy with how the campaign uh, ended, for sure. Uh, that was my kind of space campaign, actually. I had a kind of sci-fi campaign at one point. Um, it's going to boot to the similar sort of thing going on. Yeah, the um, this warlock uh, turns out they were kind of like this. Um, what would you call it? Um, kind of space cowboy type person, very uh, very Han Solo kind of character. Um, and um, it turns out that uh, they thought they were borrowing power from this kind of mind flare. Uh, and that's why they were all kind of psychic and cool. But it turns out they were actually uh, a, um, what do you call it, little brain dog guy, intellect devourer. They were an intellect devourer who had forgotten who they were and were in fact um, a, um, yeah, they're an intellect devourer the whole time who had long ago absorbed the, uh, brain of their host who the character thought they were um, and were using the powers of the mind flare who made them and that was our big reveal of that character arc Yes, yeah, big plot twist, absolutely. I kept hinting at it as well the whole way through that there were like 
there were surgical scanners that we like, oh, there's something really weird going on with your head, but then uh, something would always be, you know, the machine would break down or something, you know, someone would burst into the room just before we kind of figured it out. And this person had had mysterious surgeries or something that they didn't remember or they'd been attacked by a feral animal or, you know, something has clearly craw clawed away at this person's head. Oh my goodness. But, you know, they obviously survived and the character had no memory of it. So it's an interesting way to have a pact of the old one be a uh, Mind Flayer's kind of servant. Um, so, yeah, well, I had an absolute blast with uh, that character. And it's one of those things that as a DM when... Uh, you're kind of told by a player that you have carte blanche to do whatever you want with their backstory. They have no memory. It's just like, well, I will do, I will do something. I will do something. Looking cowboy boots. Um, some Kanjuro level plot twist. That's an incredible twist. I wish my players would work with me like that. We're getting there. Yes, plot twist is always great. It's fantastic when a player just lets you do... Uh, what, 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 you have to build up a, a really strong relationship with the player, I suppose, um, for them to be cool with you just doing whatever. Because that could be... You know, a plot ruining moment that could be that could ruin someone's idea of that character that they've spent a lot of time loving, for sure. Um, but the whole kind of theme of the campaign was that um, it was set in a like distant future where we had faster than light travel that you could go from one planet to another relatively easily, but it was only faster than light in that you know, you could reach the other side of our galaxy in 12 years if you were going full pelt. Um, and that's still like, you know, 12 billion times faster than the speed of light or something ridiculous like that. I don't, you know, maths. It was it was absurd. Um, but the way that relativity worked uh, in this capacity is that you would feel like a short amount of time had past but for everyone else it would be as if you had traveled the speed of light so when you got to a very very distant place um time will have moved on quite considerably so you might be really behind um which is why only certain people became adventurers it was a very lucrative life but you you were kind of the cost of it was that you would never really know anyone outside of your adventuring group uh, because they would always be doing x y and z um simultaneously there was a um, the main method by which people sort of like transmitted themselves instantaneously, and the the reason how there was kind of like a kind of internet across the galaxy was through um, uh, goodness, what's it called? Uh, quantum entanglement. So there were quantum computers that were all you know entangled. So as soon as you like altered something in one computer it automatically you know entangled and enmeshed and and altered something over vast distances so you could transmit information in the same way that you would teleport but you couldn't actually teleport in this universe um so what a lot of people did was they would transfer their consciousness to a machine body on the other end of the galaxy if they wanted to be there instantly but that was very expensive and so only the kind of wealthy managed to do it so one of the things that was like a real theme of the campaign and one of the questions that I really wanted to ask in a sci-fi campaign is the concept of is teleportation suicide or is teleportation um, teleportation? You know, do you become, you know, are you the entity of you, the thing that exists at the other end of the universe? Myrtle, hey, don't let your feet, please. Hey, Myrtle, please stop. Thank you. Um, or are you, um, you know, are you destroyed through teleportation? So I'm going to have to get Myrtle. She's licking her toes and she's not supposed to. Hi. Hi, buddy. That's how you get sore feet. That's how you get sore feet and then we have to go to the vet. And we've been working very hard to sort out your little feet, haven't we? Because you have allergies. You get little red feet. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah, so like the idea of, um, you know, are you destroyed through teleportation and melted down into just your base elements and killed, and then some other thing with all of your memories is built on the other end of the galaxy, or is that creature you? You know, what defines you? Um, because essentially something would have to be killed and then a clone would be built elsewhere. Um, and that's... I like to ask moral questions that I really struggle with um, or philosophical questions that I really struggle with in my campaigns. So the whole theme of the sci-fi campaign was that. Like, is teleportation suicide or is it teleportation? And also... Uh, AI. I'm terrified of AI. Um, and so a lot of it was like, you know, um, what happens when an artificial intelligence is made? Because, uh, you know, an artificial intelligence is, you know, artificial intelligence now is much faster than, than the human mind can work. That's why we use, you know, calculators, for example. But if something could operate on our level of thinking... You know, the, the breadth of human thought and still operate at the speed of, say, a calculator, they would be, um, you know, they would have the equivalent amount of time to um, figure out everything that humans have ever figured out in, you know, like 48, 32 hours, maybe a week, something like that. And then they would have already caught up to us and, you know, what would they do in the next week? Yeah, they would leave us behind, pretty much, wouldn't they, Myrtle? So what happens there with something that is essentially a god level intellect uh, how do you stop that how do you because e even if an if even if an intelligence of that nature existed um if uh you weren't in any capacity uh even if it didn't hate you you know because that's one of the big tropes of sci-fi if it didn't hate you, hate you if it was just neutral to you um, you might get in the way of its plans and it might be the equivalent of, you know, a nuisance, you know. But if you think about the nuisances in our life, like let's say you're having a picnic and there are a bunch of ants. There's not The ants aren't malicious, you don't hate the ants, but you might swat them away accidentally killing hundreds of ants because you're trying to have a picnic, you know. It's never entered your consciousness to be too concerned about what the ants are doing. Um... So what do you do about that, you know? And the idea that you can't use Asimov's law of robotics because the laws of robotics don't work, you know? Um, the whole concept of um, what, uh, what is it? The first law is you can't do harm to a human. All these ideas that we're talking about, fantastic. I will have to look that up. I will actually just right now Get surface details. Face tales. Is it a book or a TV series? What's that? Ian and Banks, a novel. Right, I will definitely look that up. Thank you very much for the recommendation. Um, uh, you highly recommend it. Thank you very much. Um, Steve says, I would like to think that an AI likely would struggle with intuition. It would only be as good as the data it has access to, so it might be able to fake uh, extrapolation and then get lucky, but not consistently. Okay. Uh, honestly, just started digging into Ian M. Banks' culture series. A different take on all these questions. Lovely. Um just got a huge lag spike yes uh don't worry it, it was here as well um we're in the middle of a storm so i think that's a, a huge um issue here i think it's the the massive storm that's kind of um breaking up our, our wi-fi connection so don't worry it's not you uh it is me um let's get some detail on these trousers while i've been doing this um You're not the first person who's recommended Ian M. Banks to me, actually. I um, I feel like a lot of people have, and it's like, you know, Isaac Asimov's stories in terms of, like, 
you know when there's like one author that people are like you would really gel with this author you would really like this person it's like yeah cool I'll definitely get around to that and then you never do so uh, yeah you bringing that up is definitely it's like yes it is time I will 100% read some Ian M. Banks finally even if it's just on audiobook I've been listening I've been um, wanting to listen to some more stuff on um, uh, some more fantasy stuff because I've been reading a lot at the moment about like real world issues rather than um, fantasy which is unlike me but um, I've been reading a lot about like trans rights and uh, and this kind of stuff lots of really lovely lovely books um, to expand my horizons and uh, knowledge about the world and uh, <laughs> like as wonderful as it is and as much as I've learned I really want to <laughs> read some sci-fi and some fantasy again you know uh, it's like what am I doing learning that's for work that's for making videos about not for uh, not for uh, relaxed Josh um, uh, recently got super into Ian Banks uh, love the culture series rereading them again lovely um, I think we had another lag spike just then. I'm not sure. Uh, let me know if uh, the internet is struggling for you. Uh, I think I'll do some dagger detail and then the necklaces, and then I might do the kind of background and stuff. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. As it is, this is a nice kind of chilled out stream now. I think my energy has kind of picked back up. So we'll see. See how long we can keep going for. Right, let's get some dagger detail on the go. There you go. Um Learnings for nerds, says George Punton. Yes, absolutely. Welcome to the land of nerds. <laughs> um, how are you doing? It's lovely to see you. Um, and uh, a very, very long screen name, which ends in llamas, uh, says hello. So hello, hello, llama person. Um, hmm. Oh yeah, if Ian M. Banks is Scottish, that's definitely why I've been recommended him before. I feel like my father-in-law has probably been recommending Ian M. Banks to me in that case. Um, uh, let's get some nice reds on the go here. Um, don't worry about the name. I, I appreciate it. Uh, El Payaso Esquelento en Lamas. I don't actually know what that means. Um, better not be any nerds around these parts or I'm off, says George Fountain. Yes. Oh dear, who's going to tell him? <laughs> <laughs> Oh bless. How's your campaign going? I hope you're having a lovely day. Um, uh, oh, I also wrote mainstream fiction like Wasp Factory. Wasp Factory definitely rings a bell. Um... Maybe that's what someone was recommending me the other day, actually. Oh, actually, you know what? Maybe that was a bomb. Pff, yeah, no nerds here. Definitely. I'm just, I'm just drawing, you know, 
unnerdy things. Don't don't look at the horns. It's, it's super super not to do with fantasy and nerdy stuff here. Pfft. That's what lame people do, obviously. <laughs> has any DM uh, has any DM made a, a PC a half dragon or a dragon? Um, I think I think one of my players played a half dragon at one point. Um, I don't think any of my players have uh, rolled up a full on dragon. Um, it's kind of I don't know how I feel about like fully quadrupedal creatures being you know because giving them gear and so on. Um, but if that's your wheelhouse, then that sounds great. Um, have you enjoyed it? If you've done that, or are you looking for resources, Reese? <laughs> oh, hiccup. In Rifts, you can play as a dragon, but only hatchling. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you wouldn't want to be a full dragon, because then you'd be taking up the entire board, wouldn't you? Um, the skeleton! Your name is a better name. <laughs> You didn't have to change it just for me, but thank you very much. Um, uh, goodness me. I really appreciate that. <laughs> you didn't have to do that. Um, uh, let's get some. Jewelry on the go. Um, and get some. Cool. Uh, what do we want to do? Uh, I think we want to tie some more dark colours into here. Uh, maybe using this brush. Um. Myrtle, I can hear you sniffing at the door, pal. Are you okay? Um. <laughs> Nerds, where? Everyone knows that D&D &D stands for dodgeball and... Uh, dodgeball? Yeah. No nerds in, in this house, obviously. We're all cool kids here, all right? Go for some right. So necklaces. What does she have in the way of necklaces? I reckon she had. Uh, she definitely had like the weird cat necklace. I remember that much. Uh, that was like. Put that one here. She had a crystal. I think she had a moon one as well. Yeah, so um, let's do, crystal can go around here. Now if I recall, the cat necklace was like jade green, but I feel like that's gonna upset the color palette. We'll have, I'll have a little look. And see what happens, but I don't really want to screw it up too badly. Well, you know what, actually, that does kind of work. I take it back.
get some lighter colors in there as well. And then she had this like moon necklace that I think we're going to have a little bit more difficulty with because that is going to be like this and then we'll have I don't know what the symbol for this is. It's like um, it's definitely like used in actual pagan stuff nowadays. Uh, it's an esoteric symbol, but I really like it. Like two crescent moons and one central moon. Uh, it doesn't stand out too much, though, does it? I might have to make a few. There we go. Um, you know what? I might, I might actually leave it there. There's a few. Mm, I could do some magic actually. Now I think about it, she is, she's a warlock. Go on then. Let's do it. Let's do a little bit of cheeky magic um, going on over here. Uh, and then I'll do a background at another time and post it somewhere. But uh, let's get some magic effects on the go because you know I love some magic. You know I love magic. Um, it's kind of autumnal themed. I feel like that doesn't really suit the way the character looks here. I feel like some green would really bring out a nice kind of pop now that we've got all this red and purple. Um, so let's see if we do. I can smell that breath, pal. That is really rancid. Um, putrid little hog. Goodness me. So smelly. Go over this bit, make that into a little group. And get some nice detailing going on here. Now I think um, we can go one or two ways with this. I can add some like transition into uh, some pink colours, which would be quite fun, or I can stick with some different greens. And I feel like my gut says go with the greens, but I think Pink would actually be loads more fun. So let's have a play, see what we come up with, enjoy ourselves, because that's the nature of magic, really, isn't it? See how it looks. Uh, does it look good though? I kind of like it. You know how I like a pink and green. Yeah, the 
bit more of that other pink back in just to smooth this transition. There you go. I like that a lot. I think that's nice. Um, magic. Yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yes, I will put a nice little spicy background in there. Um, how long have we been doing this for? So we started at six. It is now eight. I could put the little... You know what? That's record time. That's really good. I'm pleased with that. Um, but I don't fancy drawing a whole red panda that's on fire in the corner. I will maybe do that in my own time. Um, and then do a little kind of uh, wild westy background. And then stick it up on Instagram for you guys to enjoy. But I, I think that's a good effort for one session. And I think I'm going to leave it there. Because uh, I'm starting to get real sleepy. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for... That's all, buddy. You okay? Goodness me, I, I wonder if you heard that. Um, that wailing there. But yeah, um, yeah, I will um, I will see you guys soon. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, yes, maybe Red Panda friend uh, Twitch stream. Uh, maybe I'll carry on tomorrow with that, actually, depending on how things go. Um, and yeah, have a lovely rest of your day. I'll maybe see you on Twitch to do a little Red Panda friend and um, tomorrow. And uh, certainly on Monday, we will be going live with the Kitsune video, the final video of Faye February. And I hope you'll be there. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you enjoy life. And yes, I hope this has been a brief respite from the absolute nightmare fuel that is the situation uh, in Ukraine and so on. Um, you are wonderful, wonderful people. If you're in any way affected by this uh, personally, I hope uh, that life gets easier for you. Um, and I hope that in any capacity, uh, this has been a bit of a relief. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Have a lovely rest of your day and goodbye.